Sure, we're live. Yeah, we are. <laughs> we are indeed. <laughs> My goodness. You know, it's uh, quite tricky to set the, the, these things up at the start, isn't it? You know, with the sound and the it, microphone it, and stuff. Yeah, it, it is a wee bit. Yeah, we, we have a weekly fly tying group that we, we do on Zoom. And every single week, there's a problem of some sort you know, to overcome. It's, it's always the way. Yeah. Technology, eh? It's great. It just drives you nuts. A bit like mullet fishing. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, that's guaranteed. Well, listen, Colin, thanks for coming into the, the podcast show this morning. I really appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to ask you how you got involved in fly fishing for a mullet. Yeah, well, my fly fishing started off uh, with trout when I was about probably 10 years old. Mm. Or so when I was living in the north of Scotland, um, close to the River Thurzo. And my father and grandfather would often go down to the river on a summer's evening with a few casts, and I would tag along with them. Um, and by the time I got to sort of 10, I wanted to have a shot myself. So I nagged them until they got my rod, and that, that started me off. Um, and then I graduated from there to the lochs in the north of Scotland in the flow country, which is a, an area of, of huge area of peat bog, the thousands of lochs, and um, loved that area. But I moved down to the south of England in 2001, and that meant a 730 mile drive to get back to the north of Scotland for, for wow. my trout fishing. Yeah, it's, it's a real and, distance uh, there, isn't it? You know, Scotland down to the south of England. Yes, it's a fair old distance, and it, it really meant that, that I was only fishing for one week a year when I'd go back up there. Yeah. And the other 51 weeks, I was kicking my heels just waiting to get back up again. So, yeah, my, my fishing was becoming quite limited, but then around about 2005, I read an article on Trout and Salmon about fly fishing for bass. Mm. And what, one of the comments the guy made was that, you know, bass in the sea are every bit as wild as a highland trout, and that sort of struck a chord with me. And I thought, right, I'll, I'll give it a go. So I, I just live a mile from the sea. So I popped down my a seven weight and a sparkler fly, I remember, on the point. And I, I was so lucky that there was a shoal of hundreds and hundreds of bass right against the shore. So I had a bit of fun with them. And, you know, that, that was the start of it, really. But, um, you know, we, we, we never seemed to catch anything greater than sort of a pound in weight, bass-wise. Mm. But while, while we were enjoying fun with them, I kept seeing these dark grey shapes, big big fish just swimming around us nonchalantly. And I said to my friends, my friends were mostly bait fishers that had started fly fishing, you know, so their knowledge of the sea was good. Mine was pretty much zero. And they said, oh, they're mullet. Just forget them. They're uncatchable on fly. They'll drive you crazy. Don't <laughs> waste your time. So, you know, I just ignored them until it was one June evening in 2009. Um, I was surrounded by them and I had a deceiver fly on the point for bass. Uh, yeah. But you know, I was just absolutely surrounded by big mullet, sort of six to eight pound fish. And for 45 minutes, I kept putting the fly in front of them because the water was so clear, 18 inches deep, you could see them perfectly. And I could see the way they avoided the fly. And I thought, oh, there's, you know, this is never going to work. But then my mobile phone rang. I just let the fly drop to the bottom. And about 20 seconds into the conversation, the fly line ripped off because uh, one of the mullet had picked up the fly from the from the bottom and, and was away with it. And for about two minutes, I had it on. And it was two of the most brutal minutes of fishing in my life. And it made such an impression on me that I had to go back the next morning. I did, did a little bit of research the night before um, because... Everything that was on the internet suggested that mullet were just, you know, impossible. So don't waste your time. But one guy had mentioned, after about 25 pages uh, into Google, I found one positive reference where, where somebody said, oh, I caught a mullet on a, on a blood worm. So I had plenty of them in my trout boat. Went back the next morning with a blood worm, very first cast, got myself a four pound thick lip mullet. So that was it. I was hooked from that point on. No going back. Trout were quite quickly forgotten about. Bass were forgotten about. Absolutely. And then I was just, it. It, yeah. 
the funny thing about mullet, I think, is that, you know, it's kind of an underappreciated fish, isn't it? You know, I mean, people kind of pass by all the time and think, oh, that's only a mullet. But what they don't realize, it's a really powerful sport fish, isn't it? It's like the European equivalent of, of the, the bonefish. That's right. That, that's our nickname as the British bonefish and for, for a pretty good reason. Um, after I've been catching mullet with some kind of regularity for a couple of years, then I'll be asked questions about how does a mullet compare to a bonefish because of the, the nickname. I couldn't really answer it, so I thought it would be a good idea to do a bonefish trip. So I went to Cuba, um, caught some bonefish, and then I could make a direct comparison between the two. And the bonefish is, is much faster, much faster. But um, okay. you know, honestly, the mullet can give it a good run for its money. But the real difference is that a bonefish will give you two or three fast runs and then within a few minutes, even a, an eight or nine pound fish will, you know, come to come to hand quite easily. Whereas a mullet eight or nine pounds, you're, you're talking 25, 30 minutes or more. So, you know, it's much more tenacious a mullet. But it will give you good runs, especially the golden grey in shallow water. They're, they're probably the most likable fish and they can really show a turn of speed. Yeah, it's, it's incredible, isn't it? You know, it's um, like I'm only just getting into mullet now, you know, after all these years of trout and salmon fishing, because our rivers are getting lower every summer with the, the heat waves and everything. Yeah. And I think anglers are looking for like an, an alternative of fishing. And uh, because I live on the coast here in the south of Ireland, I'm surrounded with mullet. And they're everywhere. Now, I have caught them in, in the past on bread fly, you know, and stuff like that, like maybe across the bread and the bubble float. But I haven't caught one yet in the fly. And that's one of my major things I want to do now for next year catch a mullet on the fly yeah well that's a, that's a good challenge for you certainly but um yeah you're, you're right about the effects of global warming on, on salmon and, and trout fishing because um you know I, I, I sort of identified two types of people that would take up mullet fishing fr from back you know around about 2010 onwards and as i mentioned previously you've got the bait fisher who has a good knowledge of the sea and the tides and locations but they're, they're looking for a you know more of a challenge so they take up the fly rod and they've already got the knowledge of the sea and they're good to go but they, they've also got to pick up the fly fishing side of things and then you've got the fly fisher who's looking for a fresh challenge and turns from fresh water to the sea um, who has the, the, the fly skills and the watercraft at his mm -hmm. fingertips but um, that, you know has very little knowledge of the sea that's the sort of situation I was in but I think there's now a third type of person and that, that that will be the people who as, as you say that, that are having their trout and salmon the quality of their fishing affected by reducing water levels and increasing uh, water temperatures so they're turning to the sea and you've also got the dedicated bone fishers um, who, who make their flat strips to the Caribbean I think they're starting to realize that they're going to be the third person of they're realizing now that you can have very similar fishing to, to what's enjoyed on the flats in Mexico and Cuba, actually in the UK and in the Mediterranean. Um, the, you know, it's a very similar style of fishing. So, so it's, it's kind of it's incredible, fun. really, isn't it? You know, you're going to get these guys, these fishers over in Cuba who are actually interested in mullet fishing because they know it's a very similar fish to bonefish. Yeah. So they're, they, well, these yeah, guys are going to be jumping on a plane and going over to yeah. the south of Ireland and England <laughs> looking to catch mullet. <laughs> well, yeah, I actually met a, a guide at the game fair back about 2012 and he, he came up to me and started asking about mullet and he told me he was a, a bone fishing guide and I, I said well you know you should be giving me all the advice really sort of joking and he said no he said I'm back here in the summer I'm only over there in the winter and I want some you know fishing to be doing in the summer and mullets sound like they would, they would fit the bill and you talk to the Cuban guides you tell them well at home I, I, I fish in the sea but it's, it's only for mullet and they say well mullet and it gets their attention because you know, permit is the holy grail of flats fishers. It's, it's our ultimate fish, but the guys have tried for mullet and they just cannot catch them. I mean, they're experts at bone fish and permit, but they struggle with mullet. So when I show them photos of the, the fish that can be caught, and I even take some of the flies out of my bone fish fly box, I'll have some mullet flies and show them. And they can't believe how small the flies are, but that's because the shrimp in the UK are much smaller than the shrimp in the, the Caribbean. But yeah, they, they, they definitely are interested. I might just do a share screen there of some pictures of mullet for our guests so that they can just have a quick look. Um, I can see that, Simon, yes. Great. So there, there we have the typical mullet. Big, fat, silver, yeah. and the scales, yep. beautiful. 
Yeah, th thin lips, most of those you've shown so far, thin lip mullet. But yeah, they are pretty streamlined, um, which gives them their, their, their speed as well. And yeah, beautiful. The, uh, the mullet that we're looking at here on the screen, these are thin lipped mullet, is it? They're thin lipped, yeah, because if you look at the pectoral fin, at the front of it, you can see a little black circle. You can just see it in the photo that's on the screen just now. And the, the black mm -hmm. circle is a good indicator of a thin lip mullet. And of course, the, the top lip of a thin lip mullet is quite thin as well. That's a thick lip mullet, a, a bigger fish altogether. And if you were able to see it close up, you'd see that the, that the top lip yeah. is, is quite thick, thick and hence the name. Um, yeah, that, that's a thick, you can see it's got a pretty thick top lip there. That's a good fat fish, that one. Yeah, that's a nice fish again. That's on a ghost, Ghostbuster fly, that one was. But yeah, they're, they're beautiful fish. And the, the, gold, the golden greys especially have a body shape similar to the, the bone fish. And that's, that's probably where the nickname came from, I would. Guess. And this one here, we're, look, we're looking at a golden grey, this one with a kind of a gold speck behind the eye. Is that one? That, I, I would, Say that's that's a yeah. It looks more like a thin lip to me. Yeah. To yeah. It's probably a thin lip. That that's a thick lip. That's uh, a thick lip. Now. Yeah. Yeah. So that's like a real proper fish that I'm looking at there. You know. I mean. Well, what kind of a voice have you got for um for tackle, Colin? Tackle, yeah, it's a, it's a very simple sort of setup. And anyone from a trout background that wants to try mullet fishing for the first time, you can just use your trout gear quite happily. Uh, but I would say a six weight rod's probably optimum. But you know, you can go up to an eight, you can go down to a four. Um, and a, a floating line is, is, is best because you're fishing in very shallow water. So uh, always a floating line. The leader material I like to use is fluorocarbon because it sinks in salt water. You know, you've okay. got to remember that salt water is more buoyant than, than fresh water. You don't want the leader sitting on the surface because that is one of the very few things that will spook mullet quite readily. Oh, wow. So uh, carbon's good in that respect. And it's, it's fairly invisible in the water. It's, it's a good, strong material. I, I use 10.2 pound uh, gram max soft plus, which okay. some people that's that's quite a heavy breaking strain, but it's, it's a very thin material. It's only just 0.22 millimeters. And you'd probably so, need that as well, you know, for uh, when, when they're well, dashing into the seaweed and yeah. stuff like that, you'd need that extra bit of weight and the breaking strain. Yeah, that, that's right. Um, you know, I've experimented with uh, different brands and different breaking strains, and I've been broken off too many times using eight pound. That's why I stick to 10, never been broken off to 10. And I don't see any ill effect of, of that breaking strain in terms of putting fish off or, or anything like that. But one of the main problems is if you're fishing in very shallow water and a mullet sitting with its belly on the sand, basically, and, and it moves forward to take your fly mm -hmm. um, and you strike into it, it's like striking into a breeze block because the fish is, is lying on the sand and it's full weight. You know, you can't pull it through the water. It's the friction because its stomach on the sand will, will snap you off. Quite, quite readily. Wow, it's incredible. So it's a bit like uh, a trout setup, really, isn't it? You know, you're using like a six weight rod and floating line. Uh, the, the only difference really is probably the, the tippet, your 10 pound fluorocarbon tippet, like a lot of trout anglers would use a lot lighter. And what about, um, how are you uh, tactically doing it then? Are you, is it a slow retrieve? Is the fly sinking down into the water column? Is it a fast retrieve? Yeah, well yeah, it's, it is actually a fast, fast retrieve, probably faster than, than I realized because I did a program with Andy Ford last summer for BT Sport mm -hmm. on the bank. And when I saw the speed I was retrieving it on the, on the film, it was actually a fair bit quicker than I imagined uh, it, it was. So, yeah, a fairly quick, short strip. Um, but you're always fishing in very shallow water. So I would say typically four to 12 inches. That's the productive depth. So oh, wow. that's why you're using a floating line because you want the, the line to be passing over the top of the fish, not, not through them. Yeah. And the retrieve is basically imitating a shrimp because, the, the, you know, if you're fishing over sand, then the, the, there's going to be sand shrimp present. If you're fishing over mud, it'll likely be mud shrimp. So shrimp is the main thing on the mullet's diet. 
Um, and if, if you watch a shrimp in the water when it's uh, under under attack, then they dart off pretty quickly. You know, it's a sort of 18 inch sprint and that they'll do that a few times and then they'll fall to the sand or the mud and just disappear. So a good retrieve is to give you know, three or four quite quick strips and then maybe let the fly fall to the, the bottom and wait for the fish to catch up and then start the strip again. And that often induces the, the take. Very good. So, so you're Im Im imitating a shrimp, basically, aren't you? You know, and I'm looking at a couple of pictures here on the shared screen of uh, some flies at your Facebook group, and they're all kind of very shrimpy. Yeah, that's like a of... bonefish right there. Yeah, they're, they're very shrimpy. Yeah, the the first mullet I ever caught was on a bloodworm, um, and then I discovered that the red tag, that old Victorian mm. wet fly, the red tag. That that's a that's a good fly for for mullet. Re retrieving. It's one of the few that thick lip mullet will chase after. Thick lips prefer flies being drifted to them and dead drifted as well in a current in which they're feeding. They, they don't uh, like to chase too much, but uh, the, the red tag is one of the very few flies that thick lips will, will chase after. Okay, so, so I, I was like kind of that little red tag is kind of like a target point for them, isn't it? They're honing in on yeah. that. That, that, yeah, the, the fly in the picture there, that's a spectra shrimp. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll, you'll notice now that practically all, all of the flies that I've designed, I now give them a, a red tag. And that, that's really in recognition of, of the effectiveness of the original red tag fly itself. Because it, it struck me early on, there was two materials that seemed to appeal to mullet. One was the color red, um, and the other was peacock hair. Mm. And the, the fly that really made a breakthrough for me I mean, I used to catch one mullet, mullet every three or four trips, which was quite good at the time. But then a friend of mine, Joe Walker, uh, came up with a pattern with a Welsh guy called Ray Brambles. Mm -hmm. um, and they called it, it was Ray's mullet fly originally, but I, I tweaked it a little bit and just called it the mullet back because it was ba basically a die back. Um, and it had two red glass beads to form the head. And it, it was a breakthrough fly. I went from, as I say, one fish every few sessions to a fish every single session. For I think that's the one you're years. talking about, that fly there, is it? It's, it's, it's similar to that, but it's got a peacock uh, body normally. Mm -hmm. It would have a grey part, part with fibre tail, but I, I tweaked it to um, initially have a, a blue peacock feather tail, which seemed to improve the catch rate, and then eventually adding the red tag as, a, as I've done to all my patterns. That just brought everything to another level. The, the reason I did that was one day fishing for thin lips and I was on my knees in about six inches of water, completely surrounded by mullet. And I was making casts and the water was so shallow and clear. I could see the flies coming through the fish and they were separating like the Red Sea. There's something seriously, you know, there's something seriously wrong. So I thought, right, I'll try red. So I put on a flexi worm cast that and immediately it was seized. But the fish were jumping out of the water. You could see the flexi floss in their lips and they were just releasing it. Wow. So I thought, oh, put the red tag on. So I put the red tag on and I had seven fish on and seven casts. So Amazing. from that point on, I started adding red tags to, to all my flies. I mean, the, the, the original patterns still work fine. But if it's a difficult day, then you can put a red tag pattern on and it can make the difference. And tell me something, can you, is there a certain time to catch mullet? Um, when do you know that they're feeding? Is there a particular time, will they feed all the time or? Um, yeah, it really depends on the venue that, that you're fishing. And it is quite important if you're starting off fly fishing for mullet that um, you choose just one location. And I would suggest as close a location to your home as you can mm. find, but for the simple fact it gives you more opportunity to visit and you can spend more time there. because. Every location has, a, has its own characteristics and the fish can feed at different stages of, of the tide. They can feed on the ebb or they might feed on the flood. So what you really want to do is go say three hours before low tide, because okay. that's when the tide starts to move. And an estuary is by far the best location. They're the most productive. You, you can catch fish on open coasts and I can come to that in a, in a minute, but estuaries are the number one areas. So you're, you're at the river mouth, the tide's dropping, and you're just following the flow of the river down into the sea. And you're looking for fish that are sitting in the current, feeding, which would undoubtedly be thick lips. But you're also looking in the shallow areas around the flow from the river where you might find thin lips and uh, 
and, and golden greys. So feeding fish will, you know, they'll, they'll give their whereabouts quite quite easily because they're very active fish. So if they're feeding in the current, they're on the surface, they'll break the surface, you'll see flashing because I think it's to do with the shape of the mullet's mouth. When they consume a food, I food item, they often turn on their sides. Uh, you'll, you'll, sometimes before the fly gets taken from the mullet, you'll see a silver flash and that's it turning on its side to take the fly because the mouths are not like bass and trout where they can take the fly so easily. So often they'll turn on their side. So you're looking for flash and you're looking for surface movement, jumping sometimes. So that's the indications that, are, that fish are feeding. But it's also important that they're in tight groups. And the, the reason for that is because that creates competitive feeding. If you've got 100 mullet that are spread out 20 feet apart and they're feeding quite, quite aggressively, your chances of catching one that are fairly slim. Mm. If you've got six mullet that are feeding quite well and they're only three feet apart, your, your chances of catching are very good. So it's uh, the, the, the proximity to each other. That's, and why, why is that? Is it because that they're really spooky fish? Is it because, you know, when you're casting down and we'll say six fish that they all get scared off or what's going on there? No, right. It's, it's purely competitive feeding. Um, okay. I, I think it's if, catching a single mullet is very, very difficult, you know, especially thick lips, especially before September. Once September comes and water temperatures drop and they know the winter's coming, the small fish will, will leave the shallows, start to leave the shallows, but the big thick lips will stay. And then suddenly they will, a single thick lip will chase their fly. So that's the best time of year to get a big fish is September, October. But earlier in the season, you need the competitive feeding. And I, I think it's because if, if the fish are spread out, they're, they're, you know, they're quite relaxed in their feeding. There's loads of nesteries, there's so much food there that you know, they can basically take their time. But when they're in a tight group, then this element of competition creeps in. So mm -hmm. instead of having time to look at the fly, maybe follow it a little bit, it's a, a case of first come, first serve. So the hesitancy goes and you can get some really it's, smash. It's a, bit like, uh, it's a bit like a trout hatch in the evening, isn't it? When they're all coming up for the flies, yeah. constantly, yeah. they don't care. They don't even look at the fly sometimes. They just go straight for it. And it sounds That's a bit a, like that with the mullet. Yeah, so, so any caution that they do have uh, goes out there. Is out the window when competitive feeding is there. Um, e even within fish demonstrating competitive feeding, there are degrees of how they'll take the fly as well. Mm. Uh, you know, they can be feeding fairly well, they're close enough that competitive feeding should be taking place, but they're a bit slow to take the fly. Th there's two things to do then. One is just be patient, keep covering them, and eventually a fish will take. You know, it could be the, the fifth cast or it could be the hundredth, you just have to keep going. Or the, the other thing to do is just look at that, that shoal of feeding fish as a whole, but then keep an eye out for what I call hot spots within that shoal. And th these can be little flare ups of feeding activity that might only involve a few fish. Mm. They, they sometimes last for just 10 seconds. So if you're looking at that shoal that they may be spread over 20, 30 yards, you've got to be watching and looking for this, one of these hot spots that occur. And if you put the flies on it quickly, you're practically guaranteed to catch. And I, th I think what, what's happened is that as the shoal are moving over the sand looking for food, this little group of fish have chance upon a density of shrimp. So oh, yes. there's a concentration of food and they just hit it quick. And the feeding's over in 10 seconds, as I say. So you've got to get the, the fly in there quickly. So anglers down. really have to watch out for all this feeding type, type of activity, you know, where there's probably a lot yeah. of shrimp in a small area and they're all having a feeding frenzy. Yeah. Yeah. So you need yeah, to chuck your, your, your fly in there as soon as possible. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Observation is key. And, you know, when you first start, every time you fish for a mullet, you'll, you'll notice things and you'll pick things up. And the good things you'll no doubt commit. To memory, I'm, I mean, I, I've, I've always carried tide tables, they're invaluable because, you know, I found out that mullet are pretty much creatures of habit. So if you catch a mullet on a particular time, tide and a particular time within that tide, make a note of it because you'll get the same tide two weeks later. And it's very likely that the fish will be feeding in the same place at exactly the same time. Creatures of, of habit, aren't they, you know? That's it. And you can, you can build up a picture. If you, you keep making these notes and observations, you can build up a picture. And, you know, it just builds to the understanding. And that, 
really increases your, your, your chances of, of catching. So th there's lots of information to be there from the mullet. You just have to really assimilate it and use it. And what, what about the weather conditions? <clears throat> like are warm days better than cold days or? Yeah, that's, in my opinion, mullet like heat. They like so heat, that's okay. The best. Yeah, you know, originally they may have come from sort of warmer waters and uh, the fact they like going up rivers and hanging about rivers, I've caught thin lips six miles upstream in some rivers. So that maybe suggests that before the ice age, you know, there were sort of river fish that, uh, that ran out to sea, a bit like sea trout. And then, you know, they got trapped after the ice age, so they became mainly a, a, a marine fish. I've but noticed that like right, you know, during the summertime, you know, uh, you know, when I'm fishing at nighttime, the sea trout, um, the mullet will be up in the pools. And this past summer, I caught a mullet in the nighttime, you know, and took off. It was like a freight train, you know. I knew it wasn't a sea trout. <laughs> it was unbelievable. Oh, they're, they're fast. They're I was very really surprised. Yeah, they, they, yeah, they do love the heat, I find. Um, bright sunshine, they love it. Pouring rain, they'll still feed. The only problem comes, uh, I would say, with water clarity, and that, that's wind. So wind's a real enemy. If it starts to stir up the shallows yes. and the visibility is reduced, um, and, and the, the fish can't see the fly, then, then you've got a problem. So if you've got sort of 18 inches, two feet of visibility, you're still in with a chance. Any less than that, then you're as well packing up and coming home. But yeah. it's funny you should mention, mention sea trout because um, just using the little tiny mullet flies and either the dead drifting method in a and a river current that's running into the sea or, or even the retrieve. Um, as I, I thought it was a byproduct to begin with because I spent several years fishing for bass, as, as I mentioned, before I turned mm. to the mullet. And probably the biggest one I had was about two pounds. As soon as I dedicated myself to the, the mullet, then I started to catch bass of four and five pounds on the, on the little mullet flies, which surprised me. And, you know, as I say at first, I thought it was a byproduct, but then you could see that this was almost a, a, a technique that was developing and th there are times when I will specifically go looking for bass and I was, I was fishing once with a guy who used to be very high up in the bass society is retired from it now he is you know, obviously a very keen bass fisher but now he's, he's a mullet maniac you know, he's just completely <laughs> hooked on them. and I, I went fishing with him one day and I said look I've tied a heavy it was the, the die back the mullet back but I tied it on a strong hook heavier pattern because I suspected that there were bass lying deep in this river flow along with a mullet. And I said to him, look, I've, I've done this deliberately. And I, I caught a seven pound bass on it quite quickly, just dead drifting this, this fly through. So, you know, to me, to me that's, that proved that it, it could be a technique. It but just goes to show about, um, you know, shrimp, like shrimp is an all round good type of bait, isn't it? And obviously mullet are Absolutely. honing in on it, bass are honing in on it. Flatfish, yeah. sea, sea trout, salmon. So it's a real staple for fish, yeah. isn't it? You know, yeah, you're absolutely correct, and that, that's just, yeah, the conclusion I arrived at because it's the, the most abundant food supply there. So everything's going to be switched onto it, and it's very common to see bass and thick lip mullet feeding together communally. You know, they're, 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 they've obviously got a, a friendship thing going. And you'll often see them together. But the fish you mentioned on on the mullet flies, I caught a thornback ray once, which was was a bit of a shock. I've had a few flounder, I've had sea trout, lots of bass. So, yeah, as, as you say, it's, uh, the, the shrimp is a common de denominator there, I think. I think, uh, I think people are going to be buying a lot more shrimp flies now, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, on, on the subject of flies, um, the, the, the couple of flies I mentioned earlier, they kept me going a little while. Then mm. the, the mullet back was a breakthrough. But you know, there were other situations, maybe over mud, over sand, where um, th these flies weren't quite so effective. So I really had to learn to start tying flies. Um, fortunately, a friend of mine, Jim Shearer, from uh, Fife in Scotland, gave me one of his old vices and materials, showed me how to tie a single fly, and then let me go on with it. So then when I started to notice and observe what the mullet were feeding on, the, the first thing I, I noticed was a, a mud shrimp. And I actually went in the mud and took a scoop out the mud and found one of the shrimp there, took a photograph, and then got the materials to, to copy it. So then when you go back to that specific location with that fly, 
and it, and, it, and it would work. You know, so that was, that was a great feeling to pull that. That's really that, that's out. magic, isn't it? You know, you're actually going out yeah. and you're looking at something that's coming from nature, and you're you're imitating it. You're tying it yourself, and then you're catching a fish. That's a real good kind of bang, isn't it? It's a motivation. Oh, superb! Yeah, it, it really dries on, and then um, I mean, my my tying skills are pretty average, and most of the patterns I've come up with are shrimps, obviously, but for, for good reason. Um, for several years, I was trying to tie a fly, which eventually became the Roman sand shrimp, which is by far and away the most successful mullet shrimp of all. It's got me hundreds and hundreds of mullet and it'll outfish any other pattern. The only one that comes close really is the, the spectra shrimp. But it, it took me several years to get the materials that I felt would you know, create a, a, a reasonable imitation of it, you know. Eventually I found it, I think it was in Poland, a, a company mm. were selling a shell back. So tied some up and then went down to the sea and it was just an instant hit. It's caught all you know all the species of mullet in, in good numbers. So and I'm just wondering there, like shrimp is very abundant as as a bait, you know, and fish feeding it a lot, but there's also other things that they feed on too, like ragworm. I mean, are there any kind of ragworm type of flies that you tie that might catch mullet? Yep. Well, the flex, flexifloss worm, um, I think that's taken as what people call maddies, which are a nickname for harbour rag. So it's a small ragworm, and I, I think that's what uh, they take that for. Uh, thin lip mullet, uh, well-known technique for them as a met, so with a little bit of rag on a hook at the back, and you know that you can kill them with that. So I've come up with flies that imitate the met, the silver flash, and that sort of what's it, chewing gum type material, you know, the red looks really like a, a rag one, but didn't get the chance to try it last season because it was a bit of a funny season with COVID and the weather the, and the, the fishing was a bit slow. So I said, mm. I've got flies to, yeah, certainly experiment with them in the future to imitate rag. But yeah, the, the flexor worms are a pretty good imitation of it. And I think that bass go crazy for that fly. If, if you've got bass in a fast current, and you, you cast the fly out within a second of it hitting the surface, it's just smashed with bass, you know. So they obviously it's recognize it's incredible, it. really, isn't it? You know, you're kind of experimenting the whole time and learning, you know. So you're as you're going along with time, we, we, we don't fully un understand mullet and bass and all that, but you know, we're tying up new flies the whole time and learning more, yeah. Yep, and uh, yeah, every season I'll come up with a new, new pattern, uh, mainly because. I've experienced a situation where the fish are not responding to the patterns that I already have. So mm. you try and figure out the situation. And it, it might be that you just have, you can use a, a, a flexi worm, but you have to add weight and put a brass head and some lead on the body. A simple alteration like that. Go back the next day and it, and it works and you catch a fish and you're happy. Yes, but yeah, the, the flies, yeah the, the flies that I've come up with are for specific situations and lo locations. And, but then, then, you know, they work and that's great, but then you'll find that they will also work in other situations as well. As I mentioned, the, the Roman sand shrimp, that works over sand, which it was intended to do. It'll work over mud, anything, you know, a, a, a fish in the Mediterranean and the amount of predatory species that took it's just, you know, just incredible. Tell us there about, about, about the Mediterranean mullet. How do, how do they differ from the Irish and English uh, mullet? Are they a lot different? Do they, do they fight the no, same? They, or? Yeah, th no, they're, they're pretty much the same. I, I, would, I would say when I first started fly fishing for mullet, there was, there was a guy, Lee Cummins, fishing up in Cumbria in the north of England. And I think he fished for salmon, but also for mullet and guided for mullet. Mm -hmm. He was catching them with a technique that he used and flies he used. He also had some guys in the West Country and Ireland that were catching them on um, imitations of seaweed maggots, you know, because you, you oh, get yeah. that in, mm -hmm. in Ireland. You, you don't get that in the south coast of England where I, where I live, so I've, I've never tried that technique myself, but you know, all these sort of techniques worked in their, in their location, but where, where I fished it was mainly an estuary, although I also fish surf beaches and things like that. So I was fishing in more varied sort of conditions. So mm. I think the techniques that I used were, were you know, covered more than just say an area where there was seaweed uh, maggots, for, for, for instance. So um, I found that the, the dead drifting technique, especially, you, you could take that from Hampshire, where I learned to 
the catch mullet on that, you could take it to Wales, you could take it even to Cornwall, you could take it to the Mediterranean and the same techniques and the same flies would work because you've got the same fish there basically in the Mediterranean and it's a river mouth again that a fish, so, you know, estuaries, number one places. Um, you've got the thin lip mullet there and you've got the golden rays, but there were no thick lips. Okay. Unfortunately, what, what you do have is another species which does occur in the UK, but very rarely. You've got to go down to the, the French coast to find it and in any numbers. It's called the flathead mullet. Um, and the Spanish call it pardetti. And um, it was probably a year or two into me starting to fish in the Mediterranean on, on holiday that I noticed these fish. And they're noticeable because they've got sort of bright yellow fins and tails and they're on the surface a lot of the time normally quite far out and the sun catches these yellow fins and you can see them from a long way off. But the, the main thing about them is, you know, small ones about six pound, the big ones 14, 15 pound. So they're really big fish. So when I'm I saw those- I'm Google as we're speaking. No, I, I'm very interested to see what a flathead mullet looks like. Um, yeah, or the, the Latin name is Mughal cephalus. I think the cephalus refers to the head, which is, they, they look a little bit like a, thick lip but just more stocky. This, the, once they reach maturity then they develop the yellow fins. I think is this so, uh, what we're looking at here? A uh, flat grey mullet? Yes yeah, that's, that's the fish that's the fish but as I say in reality when they're bigger when they're juveniles up to maybe five pound then the, the fins are silvery like these fish in the photographs. Once they get up to six and more then the fins and tails start going yellow. Mm. But, um, yeah, they're quite they big scales there as well. Typical, uh, yeah. uh, very similar similarity yeah. to the UK mullet as well, isn't it? You know, those big fins or yeah. scales. And yeah, the, the Americans call them striped mullet because they've got the distinct uh, stripes on the abdomen, almost a bit like a, a striper, which is uh, American bass. But yeah, they, these are really powerful. Powerful fish, and uh, when I saw them, I thought, right, here's a new challenge. I think it was in the second year of trying for them before I, I had much success. And one morning, I must have had five or six of them on up to, I would guess, 15 pounds, and everyone smashed me off. You know, so oh, wow. it, was, it was a bit frustrating, but I, I kept at it, and eventually, I, I got a relatively small one, which was just under 10 pounds. Took me 40 minutes to, to net it. Um, and then the following year, I got one at 11 pound, two ounces. So oh, that's, that's the largest mullet I've got. And that, again, that was about a 40 minute fight. I mean, Is that like a specimen mullet now for, for the UK? Yeah. And yeah. The, the, it would be, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the biggest mullet I've had in the UK was a thick lip in a, a Welsh tidal river. And that was eight pound, 12 ounces. And the National Mullet Club have recognised that as a, as a UK record on a fly rod. Um, Thin lip, I've had them up to four pound ten, uh, and golden grey, I've had a few at three three pounds, which not too long ago would have been a British record. My friend of mine, Paul Jennings, uh, a couple of years ago, he got a golden grey three and a quarter pounds, and to me, that's without doubt the British record on a fly rod because the bait bait record's only three and a half pounds, whereas you know it's not far off the British record, all methods. That's pretty good, but yeah, the eight pound twelve thick lip in the Welsh River. That was a good thirty odd minutes to get it to the net. It was, it's, uh, I think a lot of fish suffer from lactic acid, like human athletes. You know, hundred meters, you're, you start to build up the lactic acid. Mullet don't seem to be affected by lactic acid. They just keep going, keep going. A five pound bass, you know, it's probably five minutes and it's easily in the net. Five pound mullet could be 15, 20 minutes. So while, while we're talking about that, I'm just kind of thinking we probably you probably need a lot of backing on your reel, wouldn't you, when a mullet takes off, you know, would you? Yeah, yeah, I would say at least 100 metres. 100 metres um, backing on it, yeah, yeah, just in case, you know, because if it sounds to me like they don't even tire after half an hour. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. 150 metres would, would, be, would be really safe, you know, compared to bonefish, bonefish 150 minimum, 200 is better, because it will oh, make wow. that longer first one, but I've fish for mullet in, in Wales on a surf beach, um, which was it was quite an unusual situation because it, there were huge numbers of fish attracted to this beach. And the reason for that, 
was because of this algae. Um, and when the algae was living in the seawater, it's white colored, but once it dies, it turns chocolatey brown. And once it dies, it releases polysaccharides and all manner of, of um, sort of nutrients for the fish to eat on them. They're very much attracted to, to this. And you can see it trailing off into the surfers, and, and sorry, into the surfers are brown, sort of slick, and the, the fish are just feeding like crazy on it. You can see it deposited on the beach, like, um, you know, just like an aero bar, it looks like. And once the tide comes back in and reclaims it, and the, this fluffy brown stuff goes back in the water, the fish go crazy for it. I wouldn't be surprised if it's in Ireland as well, you know, and if anyone listening has seen this on the beach, and there's mullet there, then that's probably the, the, the ultimate mullet fishing that you can enjoy anywhere because the sport is just absolutely fantastic. But these fish, when they take the fly in the shallows and they turn mm -hmm. to run, they, they run off through the surf. So if you've got six foot surf, they're hammering through six foot waves and beyond, you know, so that's when you need, that's when you need your back. That, that sounds great. No, Bird, I'm um, just going to look here now. You have a, you've published a book. And I'm going to get that up on the screen here. It's called Mullet on the Fly. Mullet on the Fly, that's right. An imaginative title. The best I could come up with. Yeah, I wrote that during the first lockdown. That's the one. Yeah. Because, um, yeah, but I've had the pleasure of writing for Fly Fishing and Fly Time magazine since 2010. Because that, that sort of opens a few doors and I'd get invited to do talks and go to fly tires, rows, and things like, like that. And at one, I met a, a guy called Paul Morgan, who owns Cocky Bundy Books. And we got talking, and he said, look, if you ever want to write a book, I'll publish it for you, because you know no one has ever written a book on saltwater fly fishing in the UK, which really surprised me. So it, he obviously had all the species in mind. But when the lockdown came, I thought, right, what, what am I going to do for the next? six weeks, so I e emailed him and I said, Paul, are you still interested in this? I said, it would need to be just solely mullet. And he said, yeah, yeah, let's go for it. So within five weeks, I had the whole thing written and sent off them. And it was uh, released just before Christmas last year. Well, it looks fantastic. Uh, I'm gonna ask my missus now for Christmas to get that for me for as a birthday, as, as a Christmas present, you know, so. <laughs> I think if, if there's any uh, wives watching this now, they know, you know, to get their husband's uh, mullet on, on a fly book. Yeah, it's better than a pair of socks. Better than a pair of socks, eh? <laughs> <laughs> so um, are you going to do some mullet fishing over the winter, over the Christmas season? Well, yeah. If you're in Ireland, you certainly can, because um, I've got some Irish friends who catch mullet and January and February, they're very lucky, but in Hampshire, the, the fish tend to disappear at the end of October, and they, they don't come back really till April, May. But, um, you know, some years the water's still cold that early in the season, and you need the food chain present. Mm -hmm. and th so the shrimp are there in, in good numbers, and, um, you know, realistically, you're, you're talking at least the first week in May before you can expect in a decent sport. So the season runs from the first week in May till about the last week in October on the south coast of okay. England. Further north in the UK, the season will be a little bit shorter even, but Cornwall's a bit like Ireland. You can just about fish for them all year round if the weather's kind. Well, I'm kind of thinking back when I caught my first mullet. This is about seven years ago. I got it on the um, bubble float and bread. And I got it in January, you know, during a high tide. They were all coming in this kind of um, stream, hundreds of them. And... Uh, yeah. I managed one mullet on the bread fly. Yeah, that's I, I mean, I could only dream of a situation like that here in England, you know. Yeah, jeepers. You're lucky. You're lucky. Make the most very, of very it. lucky. Yeah, I think I think you'll have to get an airplane over or something, fly over to us. And um, yeah. have you yeah. fished in Ireland? Have you come over here? No, I've never. I've had uh, invitations, but uh, never made it over. But uh, but you know, you, you can do Greyland fishing here because you got the. The river test and the river itch and that mm. sort of thing near to where I live. So you can do a bit of grayling and bike. That keeps you going. I've just come back from Cuba just over a week ago. I was away on a bone fishing trip there. Oh, brilliant. So I was, yeah, I was very lucky. I was asked to host a trip for seven anglers to Cuba, a company called Go Fishing Worldwide. Okay. So I had a good, good time. Um, I caught a permit on the first two days, which was, which was great. 
but then the, the weather turned a wee bit of cold front and down. Fishing got a bit more tricky, but we still had loads of bonefish and tarpon. And I got my first ever barracuda on a fly at uh, 25 pounds. A barracuda, was, Th those guys with the big teeth, eh? <laughs> yeah, huge. huge teeth, huge teeth. So I'm glad it got released at the side of the boat. You know? <laughs> yeah, I, uh, th those things are just crazy, like, you know. I, I suppose you're, you're not going to be putting your, your fingers uh, inside the mouth of one of those. No, I'll, I'll let the guide. <laughs> you let the guide lose his fingers over it. Whoa, jeepers. <laughs> yeah, boys. Well, listen, Colin, um, I'm going to finish up here on the podcast. And uh, thanks for coming on. It's been really cool talking to you and, and, and interesting with all these different things that you've come up with, with the fly and the mullet. And um, hopefully I'll have you back on sometime soon. And uh, Yeah, absolutely. It's been a pleasure talking with you, Simon. Thank you for inviting me. And I'm glad you survived Storm Barra. Yeah, yeah, we did. It was quite, uh, it was quite hairy there for about 24 hours, you know. Um, yeah, a lot of power went out. No, the power went out here briefly for about an hour, but it came back on. But others had missing power for six hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No fun. It's all fun. <laughs> so, Colin, no. thanks. Yep. Okay, then, Simon. All the best. Talk to you soon. Take care. Yeah.